I'm Tom Garreau. I'm, I'm a biogeochemist who works on, among other things, soil fertility restoration by various methods. And I'm visiting here the Harvard Community Garden, which has been running for a few years now. And this is right in the middle of Harvard University. It's, it's really surprising for me to see all these beautiful vegetables growing here. And um, that's the result of a project called the Harvard Community Garden, which Logan, Logan Balliet here. Yeah, so I'm the growing manager here at Harvard Garden. Um, I wasn't here when they started it up. They started it about five years ago, and it was a way to educate Harvard students in the community about organic uh, local food, and just to demonstrate how you can grow it yourself, as well as like show the taste difference, really. Um, right now, we d we're not serving it in the dining halls at Harvard, but it's a goal that we have in the future to distribute it more to the students. We're, we're giving it to, we're selling it to the Harvard Co-op, which is a group of kids in alternative housing, and uh, so that is a group of about 30 Harvard students who get it. We're also giving it to people in the community, um, and to whoever comes out and helps us on our work days. So this is an organic garden? Is yes, right? exactly. It's organic. And um, you've been using, what, compost and mulch with all these? Yes, yeah, so when I started, the Harvard Landscaping Services helped us to build these boxes, and they also provided us with compost and some Massachusetts loam to put into the boxes, um, all of which is organic. And we've been um, supplementing it with more compost that we have in our compost piles up there, and also more provided by landscaping services over the last few years. And so now you're experimenting with biochar, is that correct? Yes, exactly. Um, about a month ago, I got in contact with a company called Cool Planet, and they uh, decided that they wanted to see what it would be like if we tried using biochar in our beds here. So they sent over about 750 pounds of biochar um, that was pre-charged with mycorrhizae and a few other beneficial microorganisms. And we've been mixing it in the beds for the last few weeks, um, just in a grid formation. Since it's the late fall, we're not planting any real crops into it at this time, but we're uh, putting in cover crops and garlic in a few beds, and we're waiting until spring to really um, try seeing what the difference is between beds with biochar and beds without. So most of these you just put in the ground and mix, and then you can wait till next year to plant, but we have some here that you've already put biochar in. Exactly. That, that were charred. That starting yeah, that's okay. awesome. So, so here we have one plot where you've added biochar already. Yeah. Uh, this was at the end of the growing season. These plants were charred and they were already growing at the point that you added the biochar. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. So we added this about three weeks ago to um, rainbow chard. They had leaves on them at this point, but right now we've cut off the leaves to help uh, preserve them for overwintering. So they're pretty much just root balls at this point. Um, on this side of the 4x8 bed, we tried top dressing it. Mainly, um, some of the char has sunk down into the ground, so it's not as heavy as it was when we first applied it. And over here, we tried mixing it more um, into the soil just to see what the different effect was, um, like how the roots reacted to it being on the top, on top, and if it was still benefited, if it's still benefited by having um, biochar in it, if it was just on the top rather than being mixed near the roots. And that's a control plot over there. Yes, over there, um, there's a. 4x4 four four where we just have the standard soil and compost that we've been using. Treated exactly the same except that this has biochar rather than no biochar. So that's fascinating. So here you have where the biochar was laid only on the top of the soil, there where it was mixed into the soil, and there where it has none at all. So it would really be fascinating to see the differences. Now you, you did it at the end of the growing season, yes. so that's, uh, that's unfortunate. So it's really next year that you're going to see. So you've got to be watching that. Fascinating because if this material here, the biochar, has been inoculated with, it's mostly, you can see it's kind of, looks like wood chips, you know? It's been inoculated with bacteria and fungi, but I don't know that it has compost mixed into it. It doesn't look like it. So, we'll have to find out a bit about how it was made and so forth. Because sometimes, you know, it takes a few years for it to really develop its full effects. It's going to be charged with, with microorganisms or nutrients. Sometimes the raw stuff isn't as effective. Now, in this case, I mean, if, if it is benefiting the plants, what you'll see next year is that the roots will be growing into it. 
And um, if they don't like it, the roots will be going away from it down below. Exactly. And uh, with the mixed one, again, you'll get a different depth pattern, and it may be different again than the one that has none at all. So it'd be really fascinating. I don't think anyone has worked on that, but it, it, it's okay. really well worth following through. It'd be really interesting. So um, what a lot of people don't realize is that biochar, you can make it from any kind of wood material, any kind of organic carbon material or plant material, and you can make it under different temperatures and pressures. That affects the properties. Mm -hmm. The grain size affects the properties, but the temperature is really important because the higher temperature ones can absorb more nutrients. But now what you've got to do with this is, since it's basically just carbon, is you have to add the missing nutrients to it. And that's where the compost is really key, because it provides nitrogen and phosphorus. And we, what we also do is we add rock dust with it. We're doing scientific experiments with mixing biochar with rock powders because that's providing calcium and magnesium and potassium and sodium and a whole bunch of trace elements that are essential for plant growth as well that aren't in commercial fertilizers. You know, commercial fertilizers are pretty much have nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and potassium, and that's it. But um, you know, the growing plant and human bodies require a much broader range yes, of spectrum exactly. of elements. So, so to be really balanced, um, what you want to do is add those other elements, and the biochar holds on to them. And the beauty of it is that it's not a fertilizer per se, but it retains the fertilizers and it releases it slowly it's to the like plant roots like directly. Sponges. That's right. So it doesn't leach away. It's like most commercial fertilizers just wa uh, aren't used. They wash away and they contaminate groundwater, contaminate rivers, contaminate lakes, and they contaminate the ocean as well. So this is good stuff. And in fact. One of the things we're trying to work on, and been working on today quite a bit, is discussion of efforts to use biochar to obtain nutrients in agricultural soils so they don't contaminate rivers and cause okay. dead zones in the, in the you know, sea further down. So there's, there's a, another application of biochar as well. But the thing that's really important about it is that it is carbon. Yes. And that what it's made from is made from plants biomass, and those have taken CO2 out of the atmosphere, made it into wood, it's been combusted into biochar, which is elemental carbon, and now we put it into the soil, we've taken CO2 out of the atmosphere and buried it into the soil. And this stuff, you know, people argue about how long it lasts, but in my view, it can last millions of years, depending on the condition. You know, <laughs> yeah. Depends on what it's made and how, you know, the temperature and all that. A lot of factors enter into that. But, if, but the, the, real, the real ashes, I mean, you can see, are, are essentially last forever. So mm -hmm. the point is, is that this is done on a large enough scale. You're not only fertilizing the soil, you're helping solve the global warming problem at the same time. Mm -hmm. So this is a very exciting material for a lot of reasons. It can help clean up pollution. You know, there's so, so many applications. So uh, we're really looking forward to see how this does. And, you know, I, I think the other important thing that you're showing here is that this is a drive to a new truly green economy where we are solving our climate change mm -hmm. problems and our environmental depletion problems. And the other thing that you can do as well, you see, is that when you make this stuff, you heat it up, the heat that's released mm -hmm. and the volatile materials can be used to make liquid fuels that can replace, you know, petroleum. And it can be used to make gaseous fuels to replace natural gases, for instance. So that energy is actually carbon negative because what you do is for every gram of energy you make with those renewable fuels of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and put some back, you're putting more into the ground in terms of the biochar at the same time. So that's a wonderful, a wonderful solution to really a lot of our energy as well as our environmental and, and climate change problems and food problems at the same time. So we're really eager to see it move forward. <clears throat> One of the sad things is that at the present time, soil is not recognized as a carbon sink in the climate change negotiations. So even though there's four times more carbon in the soil than there is in the atmosphere. Now, you know, this is maybe a little more than four times here, <laughs> but, but uh, I mean, the point is our goal is to see the land transformed into absorbing carbon and being made richer and helping solve the global issues at the same time. So this is really a model for that, and uh, it's uh, one that I think people here need to know about. So I, I hope you will be able to circulate this video to people here in the Harvard community and Cambridge and the greater Boston community to know that they can see it right here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's an effort to put together a sort of global soil carbon, like I say, movement. Call it a grassroots underground movement. But uh, at any rate, I mean, but the idea is that worldwide we need to see people doing this wherever they are. 
so people could actually be learning from this example how to do it in the backyards of Cambridge. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, and right? they see the effects firsthand of what it's like growing with biochar, as opposed to just hearing stories that a lot of people might not believe. Um, what are some of the results you've had with the yield of uh, when you get a good balance with the biochar? I've actually done a few experiments with them in the past, uh, like about five years ago, and they're just like really short run um, growings of pepper plants in a greenhouse okay. in the late fall. And some of the plant, some of the, or actually all of the biochar plants were about four times the size of the control plants. And they had peppers growing and like a lot of really nice flowers. Whereas the non biochar plants, some of them had a blight on them and were attacked by insects. And it was actually very surprising. I didn't expect to see anything like that. And the control plants actually had a fair amount of fish emulsion and a few other fertilizers. Um, as to the biochar, the only thing different was just a little bit of biochar mixed in the first uh, five inches of the soil. But I was really excited with those findings, and that's why I continue to believe in the effects and hope to see the exact same thing here. Yeah. Great. Now, biochar has been used century ago. Yes. So why is it resurging now? <laughs> and when was it first used? On a large scale? Okay. I'm trying to understand that. Okay, well, biochar has a very interesting history because it's actually an ancient indigenous Amazonian Indian technology that was lost for 500 years and has only been recently rediscovered. So the story is a fascinating one. Um, when the first Europeans sailed down the Amazon, there were Spanish who had crossed over the Andes and they were washed down the river. And they described an incredibly rich land with villages no further apart than an arrow shot, with very intense cultivation, very productive lands, and large pens that they had in front where they farmed by the millions fish and turtles and manatees, all the species that are now endangered or extinct. And what they had is incredibly rich agriculture. The second European who sailed up the river were Portuguese about a few decades later, and they described a land that was completely empty of people because the people there had completely died off from European diseases. Now, it turned out that along the banks of the Amazon for thousands of miles, rich black soil, which in Portuguese is called Terra Preta do Indio, which means the black earth of the Indians, but it was known the Indians made it. It's incredibly rich soil, so rich that you grow crops year after year without ever adding fertilizer. And people have been doing that now for 500 years without ever having to add it. It's incredibly rich. Now, it's a black soil. When you go a mile or two in land, the soils are yellow. And those soils, once you cut and burn the forest down and make a little bit of ash on it, you can grow one crop of corn and you burn the soil out forever. At that point, essentially nothing grows because it's so infertile. So you have this incredible contrast of some of the richest soils in the world that were man-made and some of the poorest soil habitat in the world. And the question is, you know, how they made it. Well, no one knew because the Indians essentially died from genocide without telling anybody. And it's only in recent years that people realize that it's known that the Indians made it. People dig it up and sell it because it's such good soil. But the thing is that no one knew how it was made. And the reason it's black is because it's about 10% or more charcoal by weight, black elemental carbon. So what the Indians did in ancient times is they made charcoal by traditional methods, which is not very efficient. You get about half of the biomass, you lose about half the CO2 and so forth. But you get this charcoal, and normally people burn that, and so that the tree is taken CO2, made biomass, then you burn it, you put it back. So, but what these Indians did instead is instead of burning it as fuel, they put it into the ground. And they added the bones of the fish and the manatee and the turtles that they were growing. So that added calcium and phosphorus and these other elements were missing and nitrogen from, I guess, you know, some of the, you know, how they did that, we don't know. But anyway, they, they found a way to make some of the richest soil that has ever been known. And it's, it's only in recent years that it's been realized by analysis of these soils that, that that's what they must have done. Now, nowadays, we can do a lot better because now the properties of the biochar depend on the temperature and pressure that it's made, what the starting material is, or a lot of different factors. And so if now we can control the temperature and pressure so we can optimize the quality, we can make it 10 times more able to hold on to water and nutrients. Um, than a, a crude biochar would be. So there's a big range in properties. 
And in addition, now we can trap the energy that it makes, which they couldn't do in the old days. So that, that's a huge advantage. So it means green sustainable energy produced from biomass on a very large scale. And it means that many tropical countries or many countries in the world could be making a lot of their energy this way while enriching their soils at the same time and drawing down CO2. So, okay. so how did you learn about Cool Planet? So I learned about Cool Planet through a connection that my dad found. Um, he wrote an article for Acres a few years ago um, about Charles C. Mann and Terra Preta. Mm -hmm. So I've known about it since then, but I wanted to try biochar in the garden now. And uh, he emailed Eric Knight, who then found a few other people in the area uh, yes. and throughout the country who were mm -hmm. interested in biochar. And one of those was Wilson Hago from mm -hmm. Cool Planet. Mm -hmm. And he was more than happy to send over some for us to try out. And I'm very grateful that Cool Planet was able to help us out with this so that we could see the effects of biochar firsthand. Oh, great. Yes, that's wonderful. And I mean, I th as I say, I think this next year you'll see the full benefits because these yeah, went on yeah, so exactly. late. Now, it happened that I was here when you, you harvested this. And I've got to say, these are some of the most beautiful chart I've ever seen. They were exquisite yellows and reds and oranges. And I, I'm really sorry I didn't get to taste it because they looked absolutely delicious. But they, they were really spectacular. And um, what we did is we took it to the local food pantry here for people who don't have good food and good nutritious food and uh, it was all distributed to people who I think um, I hope really appreciate it. Uh, thanks so for doing that. That was a pleasure and so thanks to the Harvard Community Garden and to Cool Planet I hope we um, help improve their nutrition. Yeah, same. Yep. exactly.